Uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, really happy to uh, have now uh, in this video uh, Dr. Latika uh, to uh, talk about uh, social media and medical writing in uh, social media. Uh, good morning, Latika. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for your kind invitation, and I'm truly honored. Uh, to be part of your multicultural and international educative uh, initiative, which is very much in line with my vision. Uh, uh, very happy to be here. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's our pleasure. And uh, first of all, could you please uh, introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, so uh, I work as a clinician scientist and assistant professor of rheumatology and clinical immunology. So I'm currently based at the oldest uh, rheumatology teaching and training uh, tertiary care institute uh, in northern India. So it's a city called Lucknow, where I completed my tertiary uh, rheumatology training in 2017. And after that, I spent some time abroad as a research scholar at the University of Oxford uh, in the United Kingdom and University of Pennsylvania in the United States, um, and later at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. So uh, currently I've been working as faculty at uh, SGPJ in Lucknow for the past three years. And uh, here my job uh, entails a fairly good balance of uh, clinical practice, research and teaching. So I thoroughly enjoy medical teaching and I'm involved in training budding rheumatologists, uh, PhD scholars uh, in immunology and also got involved in teaching several undergraduate medical uh, uh, scholars. Uh, from India and also overseas uh, during the COVID-19 lockdown period um, with the unexpected uh, shutdown. So, and in line with our today's discussion on social media, uh, I am a, a social media editor for the Journal of Clinical Rheumatology and uh, Rheumatology Oxford and Advances in Practice for Digital Health and Technology Journal and the Indian Journal of Rheumatology. Okay. And uh, I recently joined the APLAR, uh, the Asia Pacific Young Rheumatology Board membership, and I'm also their webmaster. And um, uh, in line with digital health, I'm the guest editor for an upcoming supplement on uh, this topic um, at Biomed Central MSK Disorders uh, Journal. And uh, besides researching on inflammatory myositis, so that is my key area of research addressed. Uh, I also work on spondyloarthritis and uh, technology in science. And in my free time, I enjoy photo painting, uh, traveling, and uh, poetry. Poetry. Ah, I will be happy to, to read or listen to some poetry in another uh, video. It should be really great. <laughs> okay. So uh, do you think that we need to have uh, social media in medical writing? And uh, if yes, uh, why? Yeah, I do feel that uh, the purpose of medical writing uh, in particular has always, uh, in fact, been dissemination of information. Uh, if we were to look at the history of medical writing, uh, we can divide it into, you know, specific ages, like age one, the old age or the stone age, or just after the stone age, maybe the ancient times. So medicine and writing first became linked and people started, uh, you know, developing those scriptures and recording the beliefs or the traditions, depending on the different civilizations with the Chinese uh, uh, scriptures. We have the Indian ones. And um, so basically they were just recording traditions of various medical institutions. But in the second age, when medical physicians uh, turned into serious authors, so they really started heavily writing, spreading information through literature. So now medicine was mainly for recording, but also for like exchange, you know, between groups uh, and uh, developing and improvising. And age three was more recently, I would say the last century when writing included like scientific development, it was more like we were inching towards evidence-based medicine. So uh, it led to a lot of experiments, like you've seen, like I think you've been in France yourself and um, there's rich history out there and uh, evidence had to be published. It had to be made available to the public. 
And then we have this age four, the very recent uh, in sync with the social media times, you know, like post 2000 onwards with the birth of Facebook, I would say in 2004, when medical writing, it, it actually became more sophisticated and required like incorporation of like multimedia. We had pictures, we had better graphics, we have instant cameras, we have better sound quality. So it's gone to another level altogether, like age three onwards, it ushered a completely new era. And during this period, I feel like the first scientific journal was published in the early 1600s. You would have heard of Louis Pasteur, and uh, he established the IMRAD classification mm -hmm. introduction. And that is how the scientific discourse should be. There has to be a structure to it. And, you know, style manuals, books were published. But with this new technology, reporting science um, and its interpretation, it's not only more accurate, it's evidence-based, but it also needs to be disseminated in yes. wider ways yeah mm. like using different uh, means better graphs better interpretation so it focuses more uh, not only towards the methodology but also in the assimilation of the user end mm. so you know it, it should appeal uh, be appealing or it should look vibrant to the person who's reading it and uh, uh, it also needs to be informative not for the physician only but also for the patients so I feel like we are in this era where a lot of importance is rested on the reach or visibility of scientific material. And uh, we now have new tools. So social media is the best tool. We can reach out a huge audience, uh, a wide variety of audience. You're going to have an uh, audience in Morocco, in India, they'll be very different, you know, or even yes. in, in, like in the cities versus in the villages, you know, they'll be totally, totally different. Or if you look at the city of uh, Rabat and then the other cities in Morocco, they'll be totally different people. Yeah. So, and also you can deliver a very large volume of information. You know, you can also cloak it. It doesn't look large. Like you look at a journal article, oh, it's massive, a science article. You, know, you die before you read it. And the person like, is like, no, I can't read it. But then, you know, you can have it very concise, just in a 180 character tweet, and you can have the link. So it is for the user. If you feel interested, you click on it. And a scientist may read it while lay public doesn't need to. They just need the gist of it. So um, also our audience, I feel, is also more eager to learn now. So that has also changed maybe over the years because people are more aware, more accepting of changes. You know, people have realized that change is the only constant and you need science to build on. So we have the right medium and we also have the means to match uh, the pace of current times. So I feel that is important. And uh, I'd say that... Uh, uh, if we talk of discovery potential, like uh, the LED bulb, uh, you know, my um, mentor and Professor Vikas Agarwal in my department, we were having a casual chat the other day about your interview. And he said that, yes, social media is so important. Like a LED bulb was invented much earlier um, uh, in the 1900s, you know, but, but innovation led to its usability. Like initially, it was not usable. The light was not bright enough. Yeah. And only after the invention of LED was discovered by new researchers, they mm -hmm. could incorporate those changes or add innovation. And now the light was so bright that it could finally be used and it's it's made our lives uh, literally change. It's so mm -hmm. bright, so lovely and less electricity is consumed. So discovery potential for improvise. And uh, for that, we also need like awareness and uh, you know, awareness is, I think, like not entirely enough. So, so you also need like this interest. People need to uh, generate a controversy sometimes. Uh, like if you've read The Sapiens, uh, Brief History of uh, Humankind by uh, the Israeli author Yuval Noel Harare, he talks that the very purpose of language was to gossip effectively. So humans uh, uh, went into the cognitive revolution because they wanted to gossip. You know, so that that can be something very important. Curiosity is the curiosity gene is very important. You need to be aware, develop interest. And if they don't uh, discover it, the following steps would never uh, really happen. You know, and uh, in line with that, I feel like our age is also changing. Earlier, they'd say if you're an academician like you or me, you know, publish or perish. But I think like the new mantra, like last uh, 10 years, it's like be discovered or perish. Wow. Okay? It's publishing and no one's reading, no, no, it's, it's not done, you know. So, and that's why I think you believe and I believe that people should be on social media. The young people can uh, use it in very many different and positive ways. 
And uh, I did a like tiny literature search when you gave me this uh, topic and I would quote our world data. You will always see like tweets uh, from uh, Eric Topol, Dr. Eric Topol uh, on those lovely graphs uh, showing yes. the COVID data. And they had a nice blog on this in which uh, they talked about this uh, uh, economist, uh, Paul Romer, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2018. And uh, he had this theory of endogenous growth. Mm -hmm. So where do ideas come from? and how uh, does economy growth uh, occur? So he plays ideas at the heart of economic technologies that unless there is an idea, then uh, there would not be growth. And uh, they looked at data. So there was some science behind it, which maybe we'll just uh, deal with superficially. So they said that social networks play a key role in spreading ideas. And uh, friendships and professional ties, they matter for economic growth because uh, people tend to develop new ideas once they interact and they learn, you know, from others who are close to them. They wouldn't trust everybody, you know, and that is what Sapiens also talks about. And in a nutshell, social networks facilitate the diffusion of ideas. So there's one idea, it diffuses across different individuals. So you can call it knowledge spillover. And some people may uh, use it differently or with an enhanced productivity. And the best thing is uh, this kind of knowledge can travel farther, faster, and it is very different from other physical assets, you know, like property, money, food. It can be used by like so many different people at the same time. And, and uh, you know, it, uh, the spillover, like Thomas Jefferson once said that he who receives an idea from me he receives the instruction himself without lessening mine. So I don't lose anything, you know, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light from me without darkening me. So knowledge is light and it just uh, spreading it is only going to enhance, uh, you know, um, it's just going to enhance the, the entire experience, make it more rich. And uh, in fact, uh, the science behind the, the economists, uh, the group of economists that I talked about, they studied patents in the United States. Mm -hmm. So where do these patents come from? Because they signify innovation of some sort. And what is the probability that uh, an inventor builds on the work of another inventor? So where is this idea? And they looked at the citations, they analyzed it systematically, and they found that most of these citations carried local citations, oh. previous patents which were developed locally. So even when these citations were from a different part of the United States, it could be explained by how well connected the social backgrounds oh. were like after controlling for geographic distance and other demographic factors, somewhere these were linked that a common childhood, common social background, and they had some mutual ties, friendship, and an exchange of ideas with trust, which they could build upon. So, uh, and medicine, I feel like is that science, you know, it needs interdisciplinary collab collaboration and cooperation. We are not like the mathematicians or the physicians, we can sit in our room and just do something in our laboratory. No, because we, even a hospital building is so much more different from building any mathematics based institution. Mm -hmm. We need uh, so many different specialities and disciplines and it also directly impacts the masses. So, you know, unlike some mathematical principle, ill health is something which everyone is going to experience at some point in their life. And it is an area which will directly impact and concerns anyone who wants to live a better life. So the delivery of timely and credible information and um, to the masses, it is also very important. So it's not like we research and we keep it to ourselves. We definitely need to publish and uh, write it in uh, social media. Uh, for this, uh, this point, what's the difference uh, in uh, your points of view between the writing in social media and in the classical issue? Well, I think uh, this, certainly this major difference, which comes out like really strong when we refer to the so-called like gray literature. Uh, so the absence of uh, stringent peer review. And uh, that's why we have journaling, indexing, to see what is the quality and how it's been uh, viewed and edited. And uh, referencing is another bit, of course, like if you see an article in uh, the newspaper, for example, uh, it'll be largely limited in terms of uh, referencing. It would just say someone said this or this person said this, but there'll be no reference most of the time, just one or two. So, of course, we could also like tailor this to the crowd, like uh, journaling is more like more specific for the researcher, for the academician or practitioner. But if it is for the lay public, then technicalities will be limited. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're targeting policymakers, uh, administrative roadblocks have to be discussed. They're, they're interested in different things altogether. So it's like, you know, the elephant in the room. 
So everyone will look at different parts of the animal and be like, oh, I see this, I see that. And it, it is the elephant, but we just see different parts. So, uh, and also, you know, with so many different social media platforms which are coming up, yeah. like we have different mediums, modalities for delivering information. So like we talked about the 180 character tweet, which is like beautiful, I would say, like so concise. And then, you know, uh, or you could have a much longer Facebook post where Facebook has like so many options. You could attach a video, attach a GIF, you, you know, you could like get their attention. You could get attach a picture emotions blog posts infographics so maybe infographic is a whole new different thing altogether which we'll talk about another day and uh, the addition of these different forms of communication which are very effective even though i would say writing never loses its charm but video and audio adds a whole new dimension to it and uh, with social media channels they have now assumed uh, different uh, but overlapping roles as well like twitter may have a different role facebook has different communities so uh, so not only is medical writing, official medical writing different from social media, but within the social media platforms, there are so many different aspects to it. And um, I think the beauty of it is you provide as much as you can chew or your user can chew, like share the full story or just the highlights or and people can choose to absorb as much as they want. And uh, I think the new innovation of like broadcasting moments live so like Instagram really got big with that. So, you know, it has the thrill of real time occurrence. Like if we were to just live stream this event and be like, oh, they're actually talking like I am in Rabat or I am in Lucknow, you know, Lucknow yeah. may not be that exciting though, but I don't <laughs> So, um, so yeah, the pace of like medical science has been fast, but not as much during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It was like really fast, you know, oh, oh. right changing every two weeks, two months, uh, entire treatment has changed. Before we knew we had like low molecular weight heparin for COVID and like literally people or friends who were admitted like one month before um, like I got COVID, like they were not getting those treatments. So, you mm. know, things change. And these are the grassroots that clinicians really wanted to be aware of. So they were struggling, you know, we had busy duties, fears, hesitation, and doctors also like cannot really like share that sometimes, you know, because they have that role and responsibility. <laughs> and, and you have like really skewed work-life balance, like there were so many articles talking about women who were like really struggling, handling their children, working from home, homeschooling, everything, you know. So uh, the material on social media uh, is like very concise, it can be curated, it is easily accessible. And I feel like you could read it from the comfort of your homes. And that is a very important character. Like you're finding just a few minutes. If you're a young mom, you're juggling with various tasks and you could just go on Twitter and you read, okay, what is it for? And just a few minutes before you sleep. Obviously everything has its own disadvantages, which you'll talk about later. But uh, yeah, so that those are the uh, various facets. But that being said, uh, there's also one very important aspect which we need to consider that is the potential uh, for misinformation. Oh, okay. So it is very important to verify the credibility of sources. And that's somewhere where we need more work in the near future, maybe. Like we conducted a survey uh, among re uh, various scholars and researchers uh, during the pandemic and uh, learned that nearly 62% resorted to social media platforms for information on COVID because their widespread shutdowns, physical libraries did not exist anymore. And anyways, they were in decline. And 40% resorted to television, okay? This was interesting. And while misinformation was found across all platforms, uh, but it was disproportionately higher for social media and TV. Mm. So uh, this is something which can be looked at and can be regulated maybe in the near future. But um, um, also another aspect which I'd like to touch upon is during the pandemic, social media was also used for catharsis. So it's not just like medical writing, it's also like art and medicine. Like if, you've, uh, if you're if you a fan of like Journal of uh, American uh, Medical Assistant JAMA, they have this entire section of art and uh, medicine. Yes. And then people took to social media, there were cartoons on uh, COVID and people found, found a joint space to vent. And uh, I would say that this is very important because that develops like emotional bonding among people. Like on Med Twitter, you could literally feel the emotion, you know, the dismay, the uh, hopelessness. So people, uh, found a common space to eco this ecosystem of shared hope. You, you know, with the beginning of 2021, there was a new wave of enthusiasm that swept through my Twitter. You could see all people like sharing their pictures, getting the vaccine and, and joined hoping against hope. And I feel like this is the first step towards building trust, building your own community online in like geographically disparate locations. 
sorry, uh, you have just been cats. Uh, so uh, just uh, to summarize uh, all uh, your uh, great proposal, do you have some final tips and tricks for uh, any researcher, young or old, who wants to begin in the social media ocean and uh, to do it in the simply way and the uh, easily uh, way? Yeah, I feel like, uh, as we talked about, a social media holds immense potential to deliver timely information, which is relevant and which is credible. And it is also valuable to motivate the masses and build a healthy and cooperative ecosystem. So, uh, but we need to be careful whom the information is for. Mm. Uh, if it is for the lay public, it needs to be succinct, it needs to be short, it needs to be digested material, you know, which they can be understand, they can understand easily and they can assimilate. And the clarity needs to be consistent it is best if we have transparency and preferably source citing. So these, the latter two are aspects which we maybe need to work on. Uh, and uh, if it is patient related information, one needs to be kind and empathetic. Uh, and uh, besides you obviously see that connection and support because they are looking for that and you need to offer that. And um, on that note, uh, pseudonyms on the internet, like people, um, with different names. So an entire avatar, like if you are into comedy, the D Glock and Flecken uh, always entertaining us on Twitter. And and so they say that give a man a mask and he will reveal his true self. So there's this freedom to express which we can exploit. And people like professionals like us, we can have a virtual avatar which can be built to complement our professional persona. And it is also important to separate out personal and professional, I feel at times. And uh, yeah, that also something which can be easily done on social media platforms if and when need be. But uh, that being said, it is important to have a accountability, the avoidance of cyber sins. Mm -hmm. One needs to be aware that there a, like Twitter can be a rapidly claimable environment, you know, watch out. So avoid confrontations, poor language, misinformation, uh, in kind of like loss of dignity. And uh, that being said, there are also like tricks to enhance visibility if you're uh, looking to reach out a wide audience. Then I feel like there are these bubbles on Twitter, you know, like you have the patient ecosystem and then you have the, uh, like I am, I uh, was born in Delhi and I was brought up in Delhi, some part of it. So maybe like I, if I'm on Twitter, I'll get some feed which is relevant to uh, the, the society that I live in. Then there'll be a rheumatology community out there. And there'll be a patient community out there, you know. So you need to be careful, like, whom you're reaching out for. And there are ample tools. You can use hashtags. Like, if you want to reach out only to people who are reading about COVID, use the COVID hashtag. Or you reach out to patients. If you want to reach out to the community, like, Rabat, you use the Rabat ha hashtag. You know, like, there's so many different things. You can use time zoning. Mm. If you want to reach out to people in France, then I use a different time zone. I always like to tweet, like, 7.30 <laughs> I feel like that's a common time like in the United States people are just up and in the UK they're just like a, the afternoon lunch break and, and uh, you know in India it's evening and Japan also like some late uh, those stay up late 11 p.m. they always work late so yeah so like that time zoning is another technique which we can use on uh, social media and of course building our own community cohort many of us I think have found our communities online during the COVID yeah. pandemic and uh, so the idea is to build that community where you can feel safe, you can share, you can discuss. And uh, discussions are very, very important because wherever there is discussion, people get interested that, oh, what's happening? Let me, uh, you know, hear it out. Maybe it's something interesting. And then you get new ideas, mm -hmm. improvisation. So retweeting is important, but most important is quote retweet. Mm -hmm. You add value to it by recording your own idea and make it more original, you know, add to the originality uh, component. Oh. So I'd say to conclude, social media holds like immense potential to meet, to connect, oh. and to co-create. And uh, collaborations are the way forward and social media can not only deliver information, but also add great value to mutual learning.
Uh, thank you for this uh, very nice uh, conclusion. So uh, by social media, we meet us, we will connect. So we need to co-create uh, in the next step. I, I will really happy to have you uh, in this interview with the full of uh, this uh, information. And uh, maybe I think that we could do uh, another um, steps to uh, uh, have more detail for each uh, kind of social media, if you are agree, and to give more uh, technical uh, device for uh, the scientific community. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Latika, for all your device. And I will be really happy to have you here on uh, Ethereum.com. And uh, I hope that uh, we can meet again uh, face to face or uh, via social media to, to share, to connect and uh, to co-create. <laughs> yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you a lot.